Happy New Year! Let me pose a question for our new year. How do we navigate 2024? What do I really need? Ano po yung mga dapat nating uh, gawin uli? At ano man yung hindi natin dapat gawin uli? Ano yung ating dapat na isa-isa? When it comes to money, wealth, and possession, how do we navigate those? And when it comes to time, talent, and treasures, how do we use them? Let me answer this question of navigating 2024 through the lens of the wise men in Jesus' birth. So who were the wise men or the magi in in Jesus' birth? The reference is in Matthew Matthew chapter 2, verses 1 and 2. Now, after Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea, in the days of Herod the king, behold, Magi, used the term used in New American Standard Version, but wise men in the other translation. Behold, wise men from the east arrived in Jerusalem, saying, Where is he who, is been, who has been born the king of the Jews? For we saw his star in the east. Now, what do we know about the Magi or the wise men? They were magicians or astrologers, possibly Zoroastrian, wise men from Persia, which is modern-day Iran, whose knowledge of Hebrew scriptures could be traced back to the time of Daniel. And they were also a cast of educated men specializing in astronomy, astrology, and natural science. History reveals that wise men came days or months or years, possibly a year later, seeing the young child Jesus. But these wise men traditionally also says that they are men of high position from Parthia, near the site of ancient Babylon. Now, they were mentioning a star from the east. How did the Magi or the wise men know that the star represented the Messiah? One, the Magi could have been Jews who had remained in Babylon after the exile and knew the Old Testament predictions of the Messiah coming. Two, the Magi may have been Eastern astrologers who studied ancient manuscript from around the world because of the Jewish exile centuries earlier, they would have had copies of the Old Testament in their land. And third, how did they how did they know the star represented Messiah? Because the Magi may have been may have had special message from God Himself. Now we learned that when the wise men had come into the house, they saw the young child, see, the young child, not the baby in the manger, the young child, not in the manger, but in the house. They saw the young child with Mary and fell down and worshiped. That's how, that's how the wise men viewed Jesus. They honored they fell down, they worshipped him. Not only that, they also presented treasures, treasures, mga mahalagang bagay. They presented gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. Wow! But before we go to the details of the uh, gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh, let me pose you a question. How far do you think are the wise men to Bethlehem. The wise men were from the east, not specifically, but scholars believe that it's about 800 to 900 miles searching the baby Jesus following the star. And so they traveled 
around 900 miles. And just to put it in perspective, driving from Minnesota to Toronto is approximately 980 miles. During the time the Magi, they don't have modern transportation just like you and me. And they were not the only three who traveled, remember? They have caravans, they have servants who goes along with them, protecting them and providing for them. Now, what insights can we glean from this treasures that they presented? Gold, let's start with gold. Gold is precious metal and such as we are very valuable commodity during the time. Scholars believe that it could well be the one that financed the travel of Joseph and Mary to Egypt after they saw the young, young child Jesus. The wise man did not return back to Herod. And did you know that gold, metal, made the Ark of the Covenant? The Ark of the Covenant were overlaid with gold, according to Exodus 25. And the gift of gold to the young child Jesus symbolizes his divinity. Okay? What about the frankincense? What is frankincense? Frankincense is a white resin, which is on the lower right. It is obtained from a tree by making incision in the bark, allowing the gum to flow out. It's highly fragrant when burned and was therefore used in worship during their times. According to Exodus 30, frankincense is a symbol of God's holiness, God's righteousness. And it's also symbolic of Jesus Christ's willingness to become a holy sacrifice, a lamb without blemish. What about mirror? Mir was also a product of Arabia and was obtained from the tree just like the same manner as in the frankincense. Didn't you know that it was also considered a spice used in embalming, pang embalsam? But when mingled with wine, they form an article of drink. So such a drink was given to Jesus when he was about to be crucified according to Mark chapter 15. So mere symbolizes also bitterness, suffering, and affliction. Moving along, navigating 2024 through the lens of the wise men of Christmas, they were truly wise when they arrived and found young child Jesus in the house, and then they gave costly gifts. They fell down. They worshipped him. Wow. They were truly wise because, in a sense, they read, they study, they believe God's word. They also sought Jesus and made sacrifice by traveling around 900 miles. Suffering the terrain, the weather conditions, and the threat along the road. They also, these wise men, recognized the worth of Jesus, the Messiah, represented as being pointed by the star. The wise men humbled themselves to worship Jesus. The wise men obeyed God rather than men. It poses the question that you and I need godly wisdom navigating 2024 because most of us normally trusted our instincts our gut feeling here is the first proposition on how to navigate 2024 we need godly wisdom not worldly wisdom if we need it it has to be evaluated in the standard of godly wisdom why because in christ are hidden all the treasures of wisdom, all the treasures of knowledge, meaning everything we need in decision-making, everything we need in evaluation is hidden in Christ. Because in Christ, all treasures of wisdom and knowledge are. And then 
If you want to be a wise person just like me, I want to be a wise person, I need to hear the Word of God. I need to increase my learning. And a person of understanding will acquire wise counsel. We need to have some mentors to surround us. We need counselors, right? Especially godly counselors. And Proverbs 3, 7, do not be wise in your own eyes. Most teenagers nowadays, just because they graduated from college, universities, and they work, they thought that they are more wiser than their parents. Maybe so. But Proverbs 3 says, do not be wise in your own eyes, but fear the Lord. Turn away from evil. Because a wise son makes father glad, but a foolish son is a grief to his mother. So may I propose that we need, we badly need godly wisdom in navigating 2024, making decisions, handling money, you know, planning, evaluating. Next, not only we need godly wisdom, we also need godly perspective. Why? Because... When navigating this 2024, we need, we need to work out everything. We need to think, we need to plan, right? If the wise man traveled that many miles to search the King Jesus, when they finally found King Jesus, they responded with joy. They responded in worship. They fell down and worshiped and presented gifts. So the question being posed is, how do we determine if we are really, really wanting to navigate 2024 when it comes to money, wealth, and possession? When it when it comes to money, wealth, and possession, there are many things that come across our mind. Money. What do we do with money? We earn money. We spend money. We budget money. We save. We tithe. We give. We help people. What does the scripture say about money? Didn't you know that there are over 2,500 passages in the scriptures that talks about money, wealth, and possession. 2,500 plus, more than faith and prayer combined. The first thing we need to develop is to have a godly perspective, not a worldly perspective. If we want to develop godly perspective about money, wealth, and possession, we need to believe. We need to believe that God is the sole owner of everything. You and I need to believe that God is the sole owner of everything. When it means everything, the whole earth is the Lord and everything that contains in it. Why? Because he was the one who created the world. All the land belongs to the Lord. The land, the earth that we are walking, traveling, the seas, the fish, and all the sea creatures, the silver, the gold, the mountains, the hills belongs to the Lord. Every beast of the forest belongs to the Lord, the cattle on a thousand hills. Developing that mindset that the Lord is the creator of all things. We need to believe, we need to recognize, we need to embrace and accept God's ownership because this is essential to allowing Jesus Christ, the Holy Spirit, to become the Lord of our money, wealth, and possession. Right now, you may have money or in your purse, in your wallet, and even in your bank account. Actually, those were not yours. They are God's. It is God who owns them. He is just letting you manage it. He is just letting you to be a steward, a katiwala ng pera ng Panginoon. That's why it's important to follow God's principle, God's way of handling money. It's His money, His rule. 
The next thing, not only we recognize God's ownership of our money, wealth, and possession, we must surrender everything to God. We must surrender everything to God, meaning mind, soul, and body. Any of you who does not give up everything cannot be my disciple. Remember the story of Abraham conversing with God? And God told Abraham, he instructed Abraham, take your son now, your only son, whom you love, Isaac, and offer him there as a burnt offering. Wow, what a challenge. But you know what? Abraham obeyed. Abraham demonstrated his willingness to give up his most prized possession, his only son, Isaac. What did God do when he saw the obedience, the surrender, the complete surrender of Abraham to him? God provided a substitute for a burnt offering. God instructed, we obeyed. That means complete surrender. So now the question being is, instead of asking our question number one, what should I do with my money? The appropriate question should be, Lord, Almighty God. What do you want me to do with your money? Ano po ang gusto niyong gawin ko dito sa pahawak niyong pera? Yun ang tamang tanong, right? So not only the ownership, not only the complete surrender, but now we must choose. You and I must choose to serve God over money. We must choose to serve God over money. Jesus Christ himself instructed us that no one can serve two masters. Either you will hate the one and love the other, or you will be devoted to one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and money. Wow, that is a hard instruction from the Lord Jesus Christ. You know, we choose to budget. We choose to save. We choose to invest. We choose to build wealth. Not to hoard them. Not to just enjoy it to ourselves, but we can also be generous. We can choose to be generous with the money that God has allowed us to manage. Then fourth, we need to grow that money, wealth, and possession. I must use that money, wealth, and possession to grow God's kingdom. As a disciple of Jesus, we are clearly and repeatedly instructed to grow the money, wealth, and possession he has provided. Whether with money, time, talents, and treasure, God has given us, he is expecting us to grow it, to participate in the advancing of the kingdom of God. Take note of these instances. In John chapter 1, when Andrew heard and encountered Jesus, he immediately told his brother Peter. See, he heard, he encountered Jesus, so he shared right away. And then in Luke 19, this parable teaches us that when Master entrusted us with something, he expects us to return it with, with growth. That is the parable of ten servants. What about the parable of the sower in Matthew 13? That the only seed which results in exponential growth is healthy. So that when, when we grow the money, wealth, and possession that God has given us, we are exercising to be in circle of God's blessing. Just like the parable of the sower. We sow the seed, we, the seed generates, and then it grows, it bears fruits, we harvest, we sell, and then we sow seed again, we harvest, grow, sell, and then we help others. And by the way, there were three birds in the Great Commission to growing God's kingdom. We need to go, we need to make disciples, and we need to teach them to obey all that Jesus Christ has commanded. Finally, 
In developing godly perspective on money, wealth, and possession navigating 2024, we must stay focused on everything that has eternal results. Everything we do, everything we make choices, it has to have an eternal results or eternal dividend, not on the temporal ones. And that's why Jesus Christ himself commanded, do not store up treasures here on earth. Why? Because moths eat them, rust destroys them, thieves break in and steal. That's the first part of Matthew 6. Verse 20, store yourselves in heaven where moth and rust cannot destroy and thieves do not break in and steal. So the location of our treasure is going to be a big factor in where our heart goes. And if we continue to keep our focus on treasures in heaven, our heart will follow. Let me repeat that. If we continually keep our focus on the treasures in heaven, our heart, our thoughts, our mind, our action will follow. Why? Because eternal focus is essential in applying biblical principles on money. When we look at our money, wealth and possession, time and talents and knowledge, everything else that God entrusted us with kingdom perspective, we can create a kingdom impact and receive eternal rewards. Beautiful, right? So now let's summarize this. How do we navigate 2024 with godly wisdom and godly perspective on money, wealth, and possession, wisely using our time and talents. So navigating 2024, we need to be wise in using our time, in using our talents. It has to have an eternal dividend. We need to recognize that God is the sole owner. We need to surrender everything. We need to choose to serve God over money, and we have to grow this by participating in advancing the kingdom of God. So that the scripture teaches that money is not, is not evil, the love of money. And many people, because of the love of money, this is the root, kind, the root of all evil, that people will kill for money. People will deceive and cheat people in order to gain money. When, when people do the cheating, the killing, and the evil plans to earn money, that is the love of money. On the other hand, if we're going to review our 2023 finances, look at your bank statements. Look at your credit cards, debit cards, billing statements. Observe the categories where you spend most. And then after observing, writing down the top three or top five, whether it's clothing, whether it's electronic gadgets, whether it's stocks, or whether it's whatever categories, evaluate how you can adjust and progress in demonstrating the use of money, wealth, and possession with eternal values. Because the Apostle Paul wrote in Philippians that he learned in whatever state he was to be content. Meaning with many money, with lesser money, with much or with less, he was content. Because he says, I can do all things through Christ that strengthens me. So you and I, in navigating 2024, we need to decide to follow what the Bible says about handling money, wealth, and possession, about wisely using our time and talents. We honor the Lord with our possessions with our money with our wealth we can honor the lord so let us give as as god blesses us we need to give cheerfully 
not grudgingly, nor of necessity. Why? Because God loves a cheerful giver. So let's finish this question I paused a while ago. How do I navigate 2024? The answer, with godly wisdom, just like the wise men. With godly perspective. Wisdom and perspective on money, wealth, and possessions. Wisely using our time and our talents. Acknowledging that God is the sole owner of everything. Surrendering everything to God. Intentionally choosing to serve God over money. Use those to grow God's kingdom and stay focused on everything that has eternal dividends. May God richly bless you.